Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And even though I'm here because of a very old and long friendship with Dinesh, it's my first visit to Nistads in all these years. Um, and of course, indigenous knowledge is something that has preoccupied me the more I've realized that, at least in the ecological context, it has much more to offer. Uh, and in, with the growing concerns about sustainability, its relevance increases. I was, of course, extremely amused to hear Manmohan Singh Ji repeating Indira Gandhi's old sentence of um, the 1972 Stockholm summit on environment, saying the reason he must destroy every farm, every village, every forest is because, as Indira Gandhi said, poverty is the worst polluter without defining what is poverty, without defining whether the in tribal in Niamgiri sees themselves as poor or the people fighting against the POSCO uh, invasion right now see themselves as poor. But of course, the newspapers went a step further and they said, as Gandhi said, and Indira Gandhi became Gandhi, and of course, now we should allow absolute destruction of sustainability without any questioning. Um, I think the two key reasons why indigenous knowledge has contributed to sustainability and will be relevant to the future. The first is that deep knowledge re is relational knowledge, not fragmented and reductionist knowledge. And that's the nature of indigenous knowledge. And second, as was said, you know, three-piece suit, farming in a three-piece suit, it's contextual knowledge. It's not decontextualized. And as a result of which, it tells us much more about whatever we are dealing with, whether it be the production of food or the healing of people. In agriculture, it was recognized in 1905 by Albert Howard when he was sent to India to introduce modern agriculture with chemicals. And how Howard says in his book, I realized that Indian farming was much more advanced. The same had been said by Volker in the 1890s, who was also sent to improve Indian agriculture. And uh, Howard says, I decided to make the pest and the peasant my teacher. Um, in 1930, he's, in the 30s, he wrote his book, The Agricultural Testament, which has become the classic for organic farming worldwide was the basis of the starting of the Soil Association in England, the Rodale Institute in the US. These are the premier institutions from where organic farming spread. Um, today, especially in agriculture, indig indigenous knowledge becomes even more important because of the fact that because it's contextual, it has adaptation built into it. And adaptation is what we need in periods of climate change and climate in <coughs> unpredictability. Um, in Navdanya, the, uh, our movement, you know, whenever I go to the field, it could be a very bad drought year like 2009 or last year with too much rain or untimely rain all the time. Um, it's the farmers who are now saving indigenous seeds and using ecological agriculture a large part of it coming from Indian farming systems. The interesting thing is if you look at any stream of ecological farming, whether it's organic through Howard or you look at biodynamic through Rudolf Steiner, all of it eventually comes back to Indian indigenous knowledge. So there's no ecological contribution from a reductionist stream. It's all come all the streams of ecological farming can be traced back to India. So on the climate adaptation, I think more and more we realize that we have to have flexibility, we have to have diversity and plurality, and we have to have decentralization. And these again are qualities of indigenous knowledge. There are many threats to indigenous knowledge. Uh, and they come, one, from the appropriation of indigenous knowledge into an industrialized context. 
Um, the appropriation through patenting is what we have given the name biopiracy. Um, we fought cases against neem, against basmati, against wheat. But of course, the biopiracy epidemic continues because at a time where, um, in a way, manufacturing has all been outsourced to China, royalty collections ends up being the only source of economic growth in many of the rich countries, especially the United States. Um, so innovation, in fact, is not the source of so much of the royalty collection. It's taking place much more through either privacy, piracy, or privatization. You know, look at genetic engineering. The, all the tools were evolved in the public domain, but the patents are all in the hands of the private corporations. Um, when we started the Neem campaign, and we have a report with all the 100,000 signatures of people who joined up, uh, it was always said, oh, but you know, it's primitive knowledge. And surely, Grace and the USDA have done something new to claim a patent. I had read the patent, there was nothing new. So we had to consolidate a lot and collect a lot of the indigenous knowledge, including the scientists who had worked with it, the scientists who specialized on Neem. And we fought the case for 11 years, but established that this was a case of piracy. And the same happened with the basmati, and the same happened with the wheat. Now, the US patent of, uh, the European Patent Office in Munich has already canceled the wheat patent that was taken by Monsanto. But the, we also have a, you know, because we do a two-pronged strategy. We go to the country where, or the region where the biopiracy patent is, but we also push the Indian system to do its duty. The interesting thing is the European Patent Office recognizes this as piracy and has struck the patent off for Monsanto. The government of India, still in the, we still have a case going in the Supreme Court, saying, no, 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 this is no harm. It's all right if they patent an old Indian wheat variety that has low gluten. So we've got a very strange loyalty for the biopirates at, at the heart of, um, of these new patents. We have a report on the biopiracy of climate resilient crops. When we published, it was 500 patents, and the patent listing has been done by uh, etc. the group uh, headed by Pat Mooney. Um, you, erosion technology control is what they call themselves. And uh, within less than two years, the number of biopiracy patents has shot up to 1,600. Now, the interesting thing is, if you read, two th I want to just show you three things on this because of the issue of innovation. Who's innovating and where's the innovation? A typical patent on climate resilience reads like this. Cold stress, tall salt stress, osmotic, osmotic stress, combination thereof. Two, in all plants, Maize, rice, wheat, barley, oat, rye, millet, milo, triticale, orchard grass, guinea grass, sorghum, turf grass. Now, of the 1,600 patterns, you can pick any. They are on all tolerance, all stresses in all plants. Nobody does work on all plants. These are straightforward, blanket, umbrella claims to pirate the traits that have been evolved by farmers through indigenous breeding. In our collections, we have beautiful, beautiful, uh, um, our, um, the ones that have been really useful in the Orissa super cyclone and then after the tsunami are the salt tolerant varieties like Bundi or Kalambank or Lunabakra or Sankashin. All these traits have been evolved by farmers and now they are being patented in these broad sweeps. But that's not all. There's a second step of absence of innovation and knowledge. You might have noticed Bill Gates is getting into um, genomic uh, work very big, in a big way. Africa is pushing the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. And what's happening is a convergence of IT and uh, biotechnology. And in IT, what are they doing? They're collecting, as they say, vast amounts of genomic data, largely from the public domain. 
and rapidly reach a reliable limited list of candidates of the genomes with a high relevance for a target trait of choice. And then we let the machine, the genomic reading machines run and pick the 10 to 100 lottery tickets that might have the preferred traits. It's all guesswork. There's no knowledge this plant has salt tolerance. This plant is doubt tolerance. It's all betting. It's lottery tickets. And they are asking us to put the future of humanity on that kind of betting. Now, Monsanto, of course, as you know, is my very favorite company. And um, they've been claiming for about two years to have evolved a drought-resistant corn. And this is what the head of um, uh, technology at Monsanto said. Oh, this is doing much better. We're going to have 12 bushels additional per acre, and it will be out in 2010 as a blockbuster product. During the technology assessment, the USDA has said there are many conventional varieties that outperform Monsanto's drought resistance crop. And the science tells us that there is, and you know, this particular variety does all right in a drought year, but totally fails in a year of normal rainfall because it has lost its adaptation capacity. And you might have read the new research that's come out of the U Delhi University on the damaging of the physiology of the system and the metabolic structures of the system uh, through genetic engineering. It's, I think they did it on cotton and, and canola, probably. Um, we've got 9,000 biopiracy patterns on medicinal plants of India. So the epidemic isn't stopping, and we, of course, have a digital library, but a digital library is not a law. And this needs to be solved at the level of law. It needs to be solved at the level of the 1999 mandatory review within TRIPS that would make biopiracy legal. All the work is done, but um, it's never. The review is not ever allowed to be tabled in the work of WTO. Um, what are the consequences of patent monopolies, including piracy monopolies? Um, first, the disappearance of biodiversity. We've seen that in the cotton area. 1,500 cotton varieties we used to have. We had one of the world's top breeding systems in the Cotton Research Institute of India. Since Monsanto came into the country in 1998, not one single variety has been released for the Vidarbha region by the Nagpur Institute, which indicates that deals are made. In addition, uh, we, we've done a lot of studies on the mon 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 seed monopoly um, in cotton. Today, 95% of the cotton seed is owned and controlled by Monsanto through licensing arrangements with 60 Indian companies. And these licensing arrangements basically compel the companies to not sell anything else but BT, uh, BT1 earlier and now BT2. So that's why the market has nothing else. And when people say, oh, but you know, the farmers have a choice, I have to tell them the choice is gone. In a monopoly of that kind, the choice goes. And then, of course, there are the false claims. You know, you were always told because it's a new technology, there's going to be higher yield. I noticed from the newspapers in the last two days that um, ICRISAT, the, the Department of Biotechnology, and ISAAA, the biotech arm, uh, industry arm, they're all going to do a lot of workshops in India to get people to recognize this as a sophisticated technology and that people have a misconception. Well, there's no misconception. There's nowhere has there been an increase in yield because the technology is not for increasing yields. But the technology was meant to control weeds and pests. Even that, it's failing in. The bolgard one failed to control the bollworm. That's why they've had to bring the bolgard two. The bollworm has re evolved resistance. In the case of uh, the Roundup Ready uh, crop, the super weed emergence is so intense in the US, I think it's about 15 million hectares. And Monsanto is paying $12 an acre to the farmers to get more lethal herbicides. The preferred one is Agent Orange. 
to round up is failing. Now, while it's failing there, we are being asked to introduce it. Uh, Nidhi Nath Srinivas has just done a piece on how the scarcity of labor, and that's a very artificially created scarcity. We don't have lack of people in this country. But agriculture has lost a lot of labor. And a large part of it is, you know, the 100 days earnings for one member of the family is making the family sit back for 200 days without an income, the whole Narega Marega uh, thing, uh, without uh, assessing. Herbicide sale and machine sales are shooting up because of lack of people available for work. And I think we need to assess all this in the technology assessment of any social policy. Um, indigenous knowledge is also being threatened by not just appropriation, but displacement. Agriculture, I mentioned. How just at the time where everyone is realizing that ecological agriculture based on indigenous knowledge is the way forward for India and the world, exactly at that time that base is being crushed by a distorted economic system, whether it be distortions of globalizations or the inner distortions leading to, I mean, the tractor companies haven't ever sold tractors in the quantities that they're selling now. And I was at an agriculture summit where um, Mahindra was saying we've never had it so good. And these tractors aren't coming for free. This being sold today on credit. Tomorrow, the farmers will have to pay. Most of the Bundelkhand suicides are linked to tractor buying. And we are going to see the kind of suicides that hit the cotton belt because of the seed monopolies and increased chemical use, we're going to see it spread across the country that nobody will be able to pay for their tractor and make per purchase. Um, in the area of healthcare, one of the most troubling things is that exactly at the time where we're seeing biopiracy recognizing the value of indigenous knowledge, we are seeing a banning of Ayurvedic drugs as the European ban recently in terms of claiming that there's no safety assurance. And I think this dual assault needs to be dealt with in a very, very serious way. Um, these become issues of justice. I believe indigenous knowledge, and if you look at it neutrally in terms of innovation, in terms of sustainability, in terms of justice, in terms of building robust economies, indige indigenous knowledge is the option. Um, it can't be put in a reductionist box. The demand that Ayurvedic drugs go through the same kind of trial systems that a hazardous drug goes through is totally unjustified. Nor should indigenous knowledge be put in the privatization box. I'm personally extremely happy that there's a, you know, when I started this work 25, 30, 27 years ago, those of us who said biodiversity should stay in the common and the public domain, it was treated as something strange. Because everyone thought, oh, TRIPS has taken over intellectual property, now there'll be no place. Just worked with the Italian public, they've won a referendum against the privatization of water, 95%, in spite of Berlusconi trying his best to undo it. Around the world, the idea that large areas of our lives must stay in the public domain, whether it's at research or it's, uh, uh, as issues of ownership. The public domain in water distribution, uh, the public domain in biodiversity and seed. I think all these are issues of the future. We will go through a short time where there'll be intense contest because of the habit that has been developed by those who are used to exploitation to continue unjust exploitation. But I'm a deep believer in the victory of justice and the victory of truth at the end. And that's why we continue to do the work we do. And I'm very happy to have been able to join you all. Thank you.